Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Judd, working for Jetstack. Uh, hopefully, some of you are familiar with Jetstack because of the product that we created, Cert Manager. Um, but Jetstack also has a Kubernetes and cloud native consultancy division, and that's where I work. And over the last couple of years, um, I've basically been helping uh, a bunch of clients in the financial services and defense sectors uh, um, improve the security of their software supply chains. Uh, as you know, that's kind of a big area, big topic. Um, so I'm gonna cover a particular aspect, which is to talk about how you can improve your knowledge and due diligence around the external dependencies that you accept into your organizations, into your code bases. Uh, for the context of this talk, when I talk about dependencies, I'm really talking about Docker images and code libraries that you import into your software applications. So I split this talk into three parts. Um, first of all, I'm going to talk about why is it important that you do this extra due diligence and uh, better understand your dependencies. Then I'll move on and explain the, um, if you like, the outcomes and the benefits you should expect to um, gain from getting to understand your dependencies better. And then finally, I'm going to talk about ways in which we've helped clients actually achieve this goal of, of getting to know your dependencies better. So first of all, I thought I'd uh, <coughs> excite everyone with a few cherry-picked statistics from a couple of vendor reports. So one of them is from a report from Synopsys from this year. Uh, some of the other stats are from a report from Sonatype in 2020. Um, so I think you'll all agree, uh, basically modern applications fundamentally consist of a lot of open source libraries. Um, <clears throat> whether or not you think it's as much as 90%, a bit moot really, it's just a great deal. Um, and interestingly, uh, and perhaps alarmingly, a, a large majority of these software applications are using out-of-date versions of these open source libraries that they are dependent on. And therefore, perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, maybe a half or so of code base is surveyed um, have at least one high risk vulnerability in them. And also interestingly, I think, is that about half of the code bases that were surveyed have um, some kind of open source license conflict. And I think this is a particular area that, that doesn't get a huge amount of attention, but I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. So now I've um, kind of shown you how I can expertly cherry pick a few statistics from some useful reports. Uh, here's a couple of kind of personal anecdotal observations um, made because I've spent the last 10 years or so, not just as a consultant, but also as a tech team lead, uh, developer team lead, um, head of platform and so on. And I think it's fair to say, and not, in t not at all disrespectful, is that software engineers really don't know a great deal about the dependencies that they're using within their software applications. Um, and the reason I say that is there are a lot of dependencies, not just the direct dependencies, but also the indirect transient dependencies. So um, I looked at Jetstack Cert Manager product uh, a few weeks ago, and it's probably got in the region of 1,500 dependencies of which only about 30 of those are direct, i.e. the developer deliberately chose to um, import them into their software. Um, it's just not practical to be able to understand and have much knowledge about such a vast array of um, dependencies in, in your typical applications. So if you don't know very much about your dependencies, how are you able to trust them? And if you can't n trust them and you don't know much about them, how can you gauge the level of risk that these dependencies are going to um, <coughs> apply to your, to your environments and your companies? Okay, so hopefully I've persuaded you of the uh, need to understand the dependencies, the Docker images that you use within your organizations significantly better than I think most organizations do currently. Um, but 
in the next part of this talk, I'm going to go through perhaps what the outcomes and the benefits that you should be looking to achieve by getting to know your dependencies better. So first of all, we're looking at um, an improvement in understanding of the security posture of these dependencies. Um, and a kind of obvious example of that is what sort of vulnerabilities are present in these dependencies. And no doubt all of you are running um, vulnerability scanners in your CI pipelines, in your runtime environment. But on top of that, I think it's also important to get a good sense of like the security hygiene, the, if you like, a health check score about all of these dependencies. Um, and I think if you were um, in one of the sessions this morning, uh, someone was speaking about the OpenSSF scorecard product. Um, if you haven't seen this, I would encourage you to have a look. Um, it's, a, it's a great tool that will give you a series of scores and, um, based on a set of metrics around the way that the, source, uh, the GitHub source code, um, the hygiene rules and so on. Secondly, um, and this one, to be honest, um, to achieve this in its entirety is, is, is a big ask. It's a non-trivial activity. And what we're trying to do here is put in some automation via um, uh, admission controllers like Kyverno or Gateway, um, such that only approved artifacts, um, Docker images, can actually be deployed into your Kubernetes clusters. Um, I will talk a little bit more about this later on in my uh, talk, but as a good first step, looking at creating a trusted registry from which it is mandatory to pull your images in your code rather than going direct to um, the, uh, the, the public internet, key.io and so on. Um, as I've already said, I think um, open source license compliance is kind of a thing, um, as in there are a lot of code bases that uh, don't fulfill all of their obligations. So having some assistance to help you understand what all of those open source licenses are in your um, images and your code bases is kind of helpful. Um, now this fourth one, um, what we've kind of noticed over the last 12 months especially is that companies um, that consume software from uh, external software suppliers are starting to get quite keen on understanding the list of dependencies in that software that they're taking. And um, a good way of providing this inventory is to use some kind of SBOM. Um, in Jetstack, we've had a lot of success using the Cyclone DX SBOM format. Um, another popular choice is SPDX. Fifthly, um, you've now created all of this metadata, you've collected it together. Um, it would be really useful to be able to make that um, metadata uh, very visible via dashboards, um, to make it easy to consume for interested stakeholders, such as security teams and dev teams. And later on in this talk, I'll offer up some suggestions about how that can be achieved. And then finally, this isn't particularly a benefit, but I think it's kind of important to emphasize, is that all of this kind of extra due diligence activity and the workflows to make it happen, really you want to avoid um, having much impact on developer velocity. Okay. So I've gone through why I think it's important that um, organizations and teams get to sort of better understand and know their dependencies and also what kind of um, <clears throat> benefits and outcomes you can expect to achieve. Um, now I'm gonna go through ways in which we've helped some of our clients actually achieve the outcomes that I've been talking about. So first of all, and I think this is kind of a fundamental cornerstone, is to have this trusted registry. So rather than allowing developers or the CI pipelines or even the runtime environments, uh, rather than allowing them to pull images directly off of the internet from docker.hub or key.io, um, you only allow them to pull from your trusted registry. Um, we've had a lot of success with Artifactory and Harbor, but obviously there are other alternatives out there. 
Once you've now got this um, situation where the images are being pushed into your trusted registry before being pulled by um, the various components like developers, CI pipelines and so on, what you can now do is you can start to kick off um, security-based workflow pipelines that can start to evaluate those new images as they um, appear in this trusted registry. This particular workflow pipeline, um, we used Argo workflows to um, execute it um, for a particular client. And I'll go through the, the kind of steps that this workflow does. So the very first thing it does um, when a new image appears in, in, in your trusted registry is it generates an SBOM for that particular image. And we use a tool from Anchor called SIFT to generate this SBOM. And that SBOM will give you um, a list of all of the uh, components within that Docker image. The second set step, this really applies only to um, images that were built internally within the client organization. And what we've done here is within the uh, software application CI pipelines, we've injected an additional step that generates an SBOM from the particular software application's source code from its go.mod file or its requirements.txt file. And when we've got that SBOM, we then include that within the image that gets built um, that contains the compiled binary or whatever. And the reason that we create this separate SBOM is because you can get far greater level of detail about the dependencies that have been used in that software application than if you uh, just use an S just use an SBOM based on the Docker image. So at this point, step two, you potentially got two um, SBOMs, but that's okay because there's a tool from Cyclone DX which will nicely merge those two um, SBOMs together, together to give you a, a single master SBOM, as it were. We then use a tool from Sigstore called Cosign, um, and we use that tool to sign the SBOM and then push both the signature and the SBOM as OCI images back into that trusted registry. And thanks to the way that um, the tagging works, these um, new OCI images can be associated back to the um, image of the original uh, Docker image that was, that was triggered this workflow in the first place. Um, and the reason that this is uh, incredibly useful is that then makes that SBOM available uh, to consumers of that Docker image. Those consumers might be internal teams, but they equally could be um, an external third party client of yours that's consuming your Docker images. And then finally, we also push the uh, SBOM into an OWASP tool called Dependency Track. So the reason that we use Dependency Track is that it's got uh, some nice features um, allowing us to uh, get it to automatically run a, a vulnerability analysis against the inventory that's just come from the SBOM and also a license evaluation. And once um, Dependency Track's done that, then it's got a nice web UI that allows you to view um, all the vulnerabilities in this image that you've just processed and what kind of licensing is there. So this is starting to make this information visible to the interested stakeholders that I was talking about, the security teams and the development teams. One of our clients is also using another feature of dependency track, which is it's got this policy engine. So you can define security policies, things like these are the permitted or forbidden types of open source license that are acceptable in our organization, or we have a policy that um, any vulnerability with a score higher than seven, um, that's not allowed to be used in our organization. So what you can do with dependency track is define these policies. It will run the uh, policy engine against those, and it will give you some sort of feel about whether the uh, image actually complies or otherwise with your um, policies. Um, this particular client is also trialing another um, OWASP uh, tool called Defect Dojo, and this helps, the, the intention is that this will help them manage uh, the vulnerabilities that have been discovered um, and mitigate those vulnerabilities in, in, that have been discovered in the images that have been processed. 
So at this point, what I've done is describe a whole bunch of things and some workflows that we've done uh, for a bunch of clients. And um, the next couple of slides are our, this is what we're going to do next to help them better um, understand their uh, dependencies and to uh, improve their due diligence. So the first one, and I don't really expect you to sort of be able to read everything on that screen. Um, what I did here was uh, create a Grafana dashboard. Um, the idea of this is to kind of create a single pane of glass dashboard that gives you some insights and useful, inf uh, useful information about the software applications in your organization that have been you know, processed using the workflows that I've been talking about. Um, if any of you are familiar with a website called depths.dev, then um, this, this dashboard is heavily inspired by that website. Um, and I would recommend you go and have a look at it in any case. So on the left-hand side, that's really showing um, a list of all the dependencies in this particular um, software application. Um, in the top right, that's um, the scorecard score. Um, so each of the bars represents a different metric um, that uh, Scorecard uses. Beneath that is a table showing uh, a list of the vulnerabilities in this software application. And beneath that is uh, a count and a list of all of the uh, open source licenses that were discovered in this software application. In the bottom half of the screen, this is, if you like, a kind of dynamic and interactive dependency graph. Um, so this, this, what I did was import all of the, de the dependency graph into Neo4j and then use the tool called Neo, uh, NeoViz to be able to allow um, <coughs> developers or whoever's viewing this dashboard to be able to explore the relationships between the different dependencies, the direct ones and the transient ones in this software application. And then the other thing that we're going to look at, and there's been quite a lot of um, demos and so on about um, admission controllers like Kyverno and Gatekeeper. Um, so really what we're doing here is using um, one of those types of admission controller to basically, um, you can write policies that say, if this image hasn't been signed or if this image doesn't contain a particular or doesn't possess a particular attestation, then don't let it be deployed into this particular runtime environment. Okay, so inevitably during um, this little journey of uh, creating these pipelines and the uh, improved sort of security workflows, we learn a few lessons on the way. Um, the first of which is um, there are a number of SBOM generating tools out there uh, they're not all created equal, and by that I mean that some are better than others at providing um, an, an accurate reflection of the components in the Docker images and so on. The ones that the tools that um, we've had success with are Sift from Anchor that I already mentioned, and also Cyclone DX do a SBOM generation tool. Um, the second, uh, the second one is uh, something that Adrian brought up in his talk this morning around the fact that uh, scanners of Docker images are not magic. If you don't use a standard package tool for installing software into a Docker image, there is a reasonably good chance that it won't be picked up by one of the scanning tools. And therefore, if it's not picked up, it won't appear in the SBOM. The vulnerabilities that might be associated with that particular binary won't be picked up either. Uh, the third one, um, again, topical. I think yesterday I sat through an interesting talk about Conan, uh, C++, C++ package manager. Um, sadly, our client that uses, uh, that develops C and C++ don't use Conan. So it was kind of tricky to figure out exactly what the dependencies in their versions were for the, the C and C++ applications. And then finally, um, scale and volume. Uh, as we discovered, processing these S-bombs takes up a lot of CPU and resource. Some of these S-bombs get really, really huge, sort of thousands and thousands of um, dependencies and so on. 
and this takes a great deal to, um, of memory in CPU, and if you've suddenly got a surge of images, then for us, it kind of broke our dependency track implementation. And then the other thing to consider is over time, you're going to get more and more images. And of course, you're going to need to regularly vulnerability scan those images, probably on a weekly basis. And so over time, that, that chunk of F resource is going to grow larger and larger to kind of do that whole scanning of more and more images. So just before I wrap up, um, here are the kind of key takeaways that um, I hope you'll get from my talk. Um, open source, as you perfectly well know, is, is fundamental to the large majority of modern software applications. And therefore, performing this kind of additional and in-depth due diligence is absolutely crucial in order to you know, understand and mitigate uh, the security risks. Um, Clearly, automation is absolutely essential. It is just not practical to do this stuff with a spreadsheet and um, manu uh, sort of manual investigation. Uh, I've put up there a few tools that um, we've had success with, um, with, with our implementations. Um, and then the final point, as I keep mentioning, is make sure the developers, the CI pipelines, and the runtime environments pull from this trusted registry that's in your control. Okay, well, um, thank you for listening. Um, hope, uh, if you've got any questions, then I'm happy to answer them. And I've put up a few links here of uh, worthwhile websites to go and have a look. Thank uh, you very much, Steve. We do have time for questions. Who's first? Can you kindly expand upon limitations of uh, con container scanning? Okay, so an example might be you've got a Docker file and you um, have a custom way of installing Node.js. So you might have in your Docker file a command that curls the uh, Node.js zip file um, and then you have another command that unzips it into a particular custom folder in your Docker image. By doing that, there's, there's very little chance that your, um, sc like a scanning tool, is going to notice that Node.js runtime. And if it doesn't notice it, it's not going to be able to report it in the SBOM and it's not going to be able to identify any vulnerabilities. We won't even, it, you know, it won't know the version. For So you, what, you're, what I'm, I suppose I'm really trying to say is don't let your, whoever is responsible for creating Docker files, don't let them do this. Make sure that they use standard package managers like YUM or APT. So, no, no, you're absolutely, I see what you mean. No, you're absolutely correct. I think you have to take a view um, on how you're going to tackle images that come in from the, from the outside. Sorry, I didn't quite follow that. No, no, if you're, that's exactly it. If you're, that, that's where, you know, th this, isn't, um, this isn't a silver bullet, by the way. Um, and, and I completely agree with you. If, if you take random images um, and, and you depend on those random images, then you're still leaving yourself open for um, abuse, as it were. And, the, the, and, and I think that's exactly the point. That's the, exactly the point I'm trying to make, is that scanners are not silver bullets either. They will not protect you from that kind of activity. That, yeah, and that's a great point that I'm glad was said also with this. Um, did you look at using like in Toto style layouts or things like that where you actually generate verifiable metadata for checking all this ahead of time rather than look at something post hoc and hoping it's right? So, 
where we're going with this is, let's just say I don't want perfect to be the enemy of good. So, I can, like I said, I completely accept that this is only a step in the, in the direction of improving security. I think things like Intoto and the stuff that they're doing is great, but it still requires a level of wrapping your head around things which are quite hard to achieve. And I think there's some, some miles in that journey yet before that's, how can I say it, easily to understand and apply into existing organizations' workflows. Any other questions? No? Well, then, thank you very much. And cool. Thank you very much.